Hi, and welcome, everybody. This is Robin with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. I want to thank you all so much for attending today. Before we get started with this very informative presentation, I just want to go over some general housekeeping information. Um, as I've mentioned, we are recording this webinar. What's great about the recording is you can go back and view this information again. If there's others from your organization who you think might find this helpful, they can definitely go back and listen to that recording also. Uh, it usually takes a couple days for the recording to, to be um, processed and put up. And at that time, it'll be located on the Avian Education, pay, Avian Education page on the GFAS website. And you will see that link a couple times throughout this presentation. I do also like to mention your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with distraction from background noise during the presentation. But please feel free to use the chat box over on the left-hand side of your screen if you have any questions or if you're having technical issues. If you happen to be on the phone only and you're having trouble getting onto the internet portion of the session, please feel free to email me at robin at sanctuaryfederation.org. Please stay on the phone and listen while you do that and let me know what the issue you're having is and I'll be happy to help you out. Um, if you have any questions for the presenter during the session, please feel free to type those into the chat also. Um, we may not get to your question right away, but we will pass those along periodically during the presentation. We may hold them until the end. If we run out of time, we definitely may be able to follow up with you on some of the questions via email. Um, it is now my pleasure to go ahead and pass this over to the Executive Director of Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, Kelly Heckman. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this is a really exciting topic. Um, for us, and it's the fourth and final part, uh, webinar of our four-part series dedicated to avian uh, adoption. And these webinars are um, sponsored by GFAS and co-organized with the Avian Welfare Coalition. And as Robin said, my name is Kelly Heckman, and I'm the executive director of GFAS. And for those of you that might not have heard of us, uh, we are an international accreditation organization that evaluates care and management practices at sanctuaries, rescue centers, and rehabilitation centers worldwide. And as part of our accreditation program, we recognize excellence among sanctuaries and rescue groups, but we also want to engage with those that are not yet accredited uh, so that they can improve the care of their animals, public safety, and the sustainability of their organizations. And for GFAS, our objective in originally sponsoring this series and others that we've done with the avian uh, issue in mind was to provide uh, necessary information for the short-term care of birds that end up in animal shelters. But in response to the comments that we received along the way over the last year and a half, uh, we realized that there was a, a lot more information that needed to be uh, put out there regarding adoption specifically. And so today, um, with our final of the four presentations that we've had focusing on adoption, I'm really excited that we're covering a topic that is really broad and has far-reaching implications, not just specific to birds, but really for you know any animal that might be uh, rehomed as part of you know a rescue situation. But before we get um, into the presentation itself, I want to just remind you, as, as Robin just mentioned, that um, all of our past recorded webinars can be found on the GFAS website on an avian education page. Um, we also provide uh, standards of care for 24 different species groups. Um, four of those are focused on avian issues um, and separated out by different ecological um, habitats. And then we also have a list of accredited sanctuaries on our website. And we have that, you know, for your reference, if you are a rescue or a sanctuary so that you can go and communicate with them and create a dialogue, um, you know, that you also are caring for a certain species. And then of course, other um, collaborators that we have, um, have a lot of valuable resources as well. Um, certainly Avian Welfare Coalition, who again, we um, partner with to put together these webinars, has an amazing bank of res resources that are specifically focused for shelters, but also just generally uh, amazing resources for um, the avian group of animals. 
And then, of course, ASPCA Pro and Animal Sheltering also provide um, really excellent resources. And as Robin mentioned, um, you know, we really welcome that you do participate. This is a roundtable series, and we brought together experts so that you can really ask questions that are relevant to you. So as the presentation is going on, even though we've compiled a list of questions from people who have registered, but also for this for this particular topic, we've gathered uh, questions that are relevant to um, that we often see during the accreditation process. But if your question um, isn't answered, or you know if something uh, comes to your head while we're going through the presentation, certainly make sure that you um, type that question into the chat box so that you know we can address your specific questions um, and you can get the most out of this for your organizations. So with that, I want to uh, then introduce, again, Avian Welfare Coalition has been uh, partnering with us on these webinars, and I'd like to introduce you to Denise Kelly, who's the president and co-founder of the Avian Welfare Coalition. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, I'm very pleased that G uh, Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries has sponsored these all of our webinars, and I'm sort of sorry today's the last one. <laughs> we've had a we've had a really uh, great time putting these together, and um, we will be doing some more in the future. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Avian Welfare Coalition, we were formed in 2000 to create a voice in the animal protection community for captive birds and to serve as an educational resource. Um, and one of our main uh, programs is uh, shelter outreach. Um, we wanted to deliver resources, educational resources and support to those animal shelters that take in birds and also to um, encourage uh, avian rescue groups to um, join us and to explore the benefits of GFAS accreditation. Um, I can't tell you how the accreditation process uh, is vigorous, but and the standards are high, but I think we all agree that the birds in our care deserve nothing less, and they are a fabulous resource and in developing um, small rescue groups so that they can become accredited. Um, I'm going to make my comments brief because I want to get right to um, Jane Hoffman. Um, Jane Hoffman is the Mayor's Alliance, uh, found, helped found the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals in 2002 and has served as its president ever since. Um, the alliance was created to work with the City of New York to apply creative targeted solutions to New York City's homeless animal crisis. Um, they now have over 150 plus rescue groups and shelters that participate in the alliance. It's a very vibrant alliance. Um, they have several programs that are that are really uh, Jane has uh, highlighted here, which is their Wheels of Hope Transport Program, which runs a small fleet of custom vans to move animals out of shelters, and the Feral Cat Initiative, which promotes spay neuter, um, which promotes excuse me trap neuter return. Um, and the Alliance's mega adoption events, which brings together uh, hundreds of groups, and they've placed thousands of animals uh, throughout uh, the years through that program. They also have a Helping Pets and People in Crisis program, which provides assistance to individuals and families fleeing domestic violence, seniors who need help with their animals, and families who are facing uh, eviction or other temporary setbacks. Um, in addition to her commitment to the Alliance, um, Jane is also the founding member and former secretary and chair of the New York City Bar Association's Animal Law Committee, which was the first of its kind in the United States. She also served as chair and secretary of the board of the Farm Sanctuary since the early 1990s. Jane is an attorney. Um, and she uh, formerly uh, was uh, specialized in taxation, executive compensation, and estate planning. 
and she was also a consultant at the Handy Associates, a management consulting firm working on mergers and acquisitions. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to um, Kelly and Jane. Okay, I guess that's my cue. Thank you very much for the introduction. Sorry that took so much time. Um, I'm just going to plunge right into this. And for some of this of you, this may be a little basic, but I think it's good to start with the basics, and that's why it's our first question. Um, the basics of a contract are you have to have an offer, you have to have an acceptance of that offer, and then there has to be consideration. In addition, there also has to be what we call a meeting of the minds. So the most important thing in a contract and in an adoption contract, any contract really, is that both people know sort of what they're getting into and what they're agreeing to, um, which is why you know it's, it's very, very important that you make sure that you understand that you're offering this animal for adoption, the person is accepting, uh, understands that they're adopting this animal, that you have this meeting of the minds, and then there is some consideration. Um, the next question, actually, this flows into that, which is, if an animal is adopted out without a fee, is the placement still subject to contract law? And the answer, this is a good question, the answer is, and I know when people hate this when lawyers say it, but maybe. Um, there's certain contracts that have to be in writing. Um, that's the sale of real property, um, you know, door-to-door -door sales contracts, motor vehicles. Other things don't have to necessarily um, be written down, but it's really kind of foolish not to have a written contract. Because to go back previously, you want to make sure everybody knows what the offer was, what the acceptance was, uh, the consideration to make sure you have a valid contract, that you've had a meeting of the minds. So often the law doesn't necessarily specify what the consideration is. Um, but you want to make sure that there has been consideration. And in your contract, you can actually say for good and sufficient consideration that these parties have, you know, are making this contract for good and sufficient consideration. So, for instance, if you wanted to waive the fee for some reason, or for some reason you do adoptions um, without a fee, you still want to have a written contract and you want to have the fact that consideration has been given and received. Um, you know, in a way, often we talk about adoption fees as donations, um, which is why you maybe really just want to get into for good and sufficient consideration. You want to make sure that this is not a gift, that, that it's very clear that you are not just giving this bird as a gift or whatever animal you're placing to this person as a gift, which again goes back to why you want to have a written contract so it's very clear that this is an adoption, this is a contract, there's certain um, you know, paragraphs, items, um, agreements that are made in this written document that you can then point to later. And we'll get to some more specifics about that a little later. So yes, you could have um, an animal adopted out without an actual fee. You don't have to reference a dollar amount, but you do need language that conveys the fact that both parties have, have agreed that consideration was given um, for this placement. Um, I kind of started in on the third question, can an oral agreement be enforceable and under what conditions? As I said, we're not talking about automobiles or door-to-door -door sales or, or the sale of real property here, but an oral agreement, you know, there's the, I don't know if you've ever heard that expression that an oral agreement is worth the paper it's written on. In other words, it's kind of nothing because it can degenerate into a he said, she said. I mean, if you had a truly, truly independent party that overheard this conversation and that would you know, testify or do 
uh, give a statement to that fact that there was, this is a, an adoption um, and that there were terms and conditions that were going to apply, but you really don't want to get into that situation. Um, and actually how enforceable oral contracts are can vary from state to state. I'm licensed to practice in the state of New York and I'm basically talking about New York state law, um, but it's always a good idea to have it in writing. Um, you know, there's a, there, if it's in writing, nobody can go back later and say, that wasn't what I meant, that wasn't what I said, because you've got it in black and white and you can point to it. Um, this is a, important if you're putting conditions, you're putting disclaimers, um, you know, into the agreement. Um, so always have a written contract and have it to be as precise and clear as possible. Um, our fourth question is legally, what is the difference between an animal guardian and an owner? How do these terms affect a person's right under the law? Basically, animal guardian is not a legal term. There have been some places that have put that in law in animal owner or animal guardian. Um, but basically, owner is the most precise term that you can use. Because whether we like it or not at this point, and I certainly am waiting for the day when it changes, animals at this point are property. And property has an owner. So, you know, you want to make sure you're using the right terms when you're transferring what's essentially legal ownership from one, your organization to an adopter. Um, you know, once again, there's, there's really no such thing as quote unquote animal guardian under the law. Um, and it's really not something you want to get into. I know a lot of people think, we think of ourselves as guardians, not owners, but frankly, under the law, you want to have, be using the, the language that should be used in a contract, and that's the word owner. Um, now, you know, you also want to have language um, that basically talks about ownership you know you are the owner of the animal you're adopting out you're going to pass good title for lack of a better word to that person but you also want to be clear because you are going to want to put in your contract that ownership will revert back to you the group if the elements of this contract that this person has agreed to ha have not been fulfilled so, you know, I know, I don't want to even hate to word the, use the expression politically correct, but at this point in time in the United States, animals are still property and we need to use the right terms, which is, which is owner. Um, the next question is, we want to include language that will ensure that all adopted animals, in this case horses, are returned to us the rescue in the case that they are no longer wanted or in the event they are they are cared for improperly right now we do not give up quote unquote ownership of the horse but rather transfer quote unquote guardianship is this legally enforceable could we instead use a co-ownership agreement um you know once again guardianship is 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 really not a a term that we use in connection at this point in time in the United States with respect to animals. Guardianship can be guardianship of a, of a child, of a minor, um, perhaps an incapacitated uh, person or a, a senior, um, but we don't really use the term guardianship. Um, you know, so once again, um, if you were trying to, I guess in a way, these are two totally separate. These are really good questions, by the way. I was really impressed. Um, in the case they're no longer wanted um, is a little different than improperly cared for. If they're no longer wanted, um, 
those are the kind of terms you would want clearly set out in your contra adoption contract that says the animals are to be returned to you and not transferred, ownership may not be transferred to another party without the written consent. Um, if you want to perhaps be able to have the person adopt that animal or, or transfer the ownership of that horse to another person, as long as you're consulted and your uh, consent has to be given in writing. Um, if they're not cared for properly, um, that again is another contract term that you would want to have in there about ownership. You know, if X, Y, and Z is not done, um, and this would be, spe you know, species specific, obviously, that, you know, the group re retains the right to get the animal back, essentially. Um, so again, that's why you want a written contract. That's why you want to have very specific terms and the specificity within each term, for instance, what kind of things do you need to have to satisfy you that a horse or a bird or a rabbit or any kind of animal is being pro properly taken care of? And what level of ability to inspect to make sure those things are happening um, do you want to have in there? Um, one thought here is, and I don't know if this is commonly done with horses, but do you want to create, you might want to create a foster agreement. There's a, a little, a question a little later um, about having a probationary period where your group retains ownership. You retain ownership of the horse or cat or dog or rabbit or bird until a, a set time or if something happens um, that, but that you, it's clear that you retain ownership, that they are merely a foster home. So this goes back to the fact that you should also have a foster agreement. Um, and one of the things you're going to have to um, think about is, are you going to have the same sort of evaluation done of a foster home that you would do for an adoptive home? Um, those are all questions you have to think about. But in this question, I think the guardianship thing is not going to work. I think, you know, foster of animals, we call it with dogs and cats, foster with an intent which means this person probably intends to adopt this um, animal, but we both want to try this out to see if this is going to work for both of us. So you have a really good foster agreement. This is a, as important to have a foster um, agreement as it is to have an adoption agreement. Um, I think co-ownership gets really messy. Um, I think it's better to retain ownership of the animal until such time you feel comfortable um, just outright adopting this animal to uh, the individual. Uh, the next question, and here we go, is we want to integrate a probation period like six months with home visits before handing over ownership of the animal to the new owner. Is this legally sound? Um, again, I would strongly advise the group to keep, if you have any questions, um, keep ownership of the animal. Make it very clear that this animal, you are not transferring title to this animal. You are not transferring ownership. This is a foster agreement. You can pull that animal back to your group at any time for any reason. Um, so I think of what we call again, you can call it a probation period. You can call it a foster uh, with intent. Um, but don't mess up the lines of ownership. You retain ownership, you foster out the animal, um, and then you're going to have a much easier case. Um, well, it's never often easy, but an easier, well, let's say a more, uh, a clearer path um, if you do have to, to actually take legal action against this person. Um, okay, the next one, and here we go. We placed a bird in foster care that ended up staying six weeks longer than our original agreement called for. The individual agreed to continue to care for the bird. 
Now she is ignoring our foster agreement and phone calls and refuses to return the bird, claiming that possession is, actually it's nine-tenths ten, <laughs> nine of the law. What are our legal rights? Okay, in your foster agreement, if this was well drafted, which I'm assuming it is, title was not transferred and you do still own um, the bird. So you need a really tight foster agreement that makes it very, very clear. Um, if you were going to extend that agreement, um, as seemed to be the case here, I might actually do a second writing um, and say we are extending the foster agreement that was, you know, agreed to and signed on, you know, bumpy dump date. Um, so that's very clear that you know, your agreement, if your agreement was originally for a set period of time, especially, you probably want to go back and get an agreement in writing that, for instance, there can't be a, uh, an argument made that you abandoned this animal to this person. Um, and, you know, despite their trying to get in touch with you, because again, you don't ever want to get into a he said, she said um, situation. So, in your foster agreement, if it's for a set period of time, then I would do an extension of the foster agreement in writing. Um, if you, it's not for a set time, then you probably want to have some language in there that said, or for any period of time that, you know, this agreement will remain in effect for any additional time, um, you know, for the, for the entire time this animal's in foster care with this person. Um, the, about the nine tenths of the law, um, I think this also sort of goes a little bit into the next question. Um, but to stay with this, two things that are, are important to understand, um, and to have in your agreement. Number one, you need to have a liquidated damages clause. And Frankly, I would make that as high as whatever the small claims limit is in your state or, or city. Well, they're usually much more locally cited, your city. For instance, in New York City, our small claims court limit is $5,000. That means anybody unrepresented, can you can have a lawyer in small claims court, and under certain circumstances you have to, but that's really more if you're a business. You can go go into, and for this purpose, I don't think a not-for-profit would be considered a business for under those terms. You can go to small claims court if you have a good written foster agreement that specifically sets out that this bird belongs to you, this person is merely fostering this animal for a set period of time, and that you, you know, at the end of that time, you want the animal back. Um, you are going to be able to have that person come into small claims court, you file a summons and complaint, um, and you deliver it to the person, the foster. You do it by mail. You can put it on their door. There's a lot of different ways. And I'm talking about New York small claims court, but most small claims court are incredibly friendly um, to people who don't have an attorney, who are just coming in and and that's why we set up these small claims courts. And they're very, usually fairly inexpensive to file a claim if there's any fee at all. Um, and the, the point of this is, I understand we want to get the bird back or whatever the animal is. But if you have a liquidated damages clause, it gives you leverage. You can go into small claims court and if you can make a very clear case, and again, this is a third party who is doesn't want to hear he said, she said, you as much paper as you can throw at that as possible to prove it's your bird, it's this bird, you come in with pictures, you come in with vet records, you come in with this foster agreement, and you say, this person has taken our property, our, this bird, and we want it back. Um, unfortunately, in small claims court, you can only get uh, money at least in New York State. Again, go on the website for your locality's small claims court and see what your rules are. In New York State, you can get only get money. But money can be used as an inducement to get that person perhaps to return the bird to you. If they, 
if they if you go into court and you get a judgment and you say hey you give us the bird back we're not going to you know follow up to get this money from you why don't you return the bird to us and we're all good if they don't do that and then you can enforce a judgment if you get the judgment you enforce the judgment against them you have that money you can then take that money and go to your civil court and file um, uh, what's called a replevin action, which is a specific action to get back property that does not, that belongs to you that somebody else has. So it's you must have both. You must have a liquidate. You should have, sorry, a liquidated damage clause, which for the highest amount possible in your jurisdiction for your small claims court to be used as leverage. And the other thing is you need to have language in your contract that reserves any other rights that you have to pursue this person, um, which means that, okay, yeah, I got this money in small claims court, but I'm also coming after you in civil court for a replevin action um, because I want the bird back. So it's just really um, trying to give you leverage against this person. Um, again, yeah, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Um, the other thing you could do, um, which is usually not very successful, is go to uh, your local police and you know tell them this person has stolen your property and you want it back. And with respect to horses or some of your birds, which are uh, very long lived and I believe fairly expensive if one was buying one, um, you might be able to make a case, especially if you have an agreement. So once again, an agreement in writing is always worthwhile. A lot of times police are just going to say, I'm sorry, this is a civil matter. This is not a criminal matter. Um, with respect to a horse or you know, a, a bird that's worth a lot of money, they may um, take a little more um, interest in that. Um, so regarding legal contracts is it realistic to draw up a contract when most rescues do not have the funds or legal resources to enforce we don't mean to sound jaded nothing wrong with sounding jaded but we found that some people find the contract more akin to a list of preferences rather than a document that can and will be enforced um you know we just went through you may not Anybody, I think, will have the funds to go to small claims court. Um, I think in New York it costs, well, it used to cost like 25 bucks. It may be more now. Um, but that gives you the ability to at least get some, that person to court and to, um, you know, perhaps get a judgment against them, which is going to make them pay a little more attention to your demand to get the dog, I'm sorry, the bird or the horse or whatever back again. So once again, you want a really, you need a written contract, you lay out what the agreement is, either with respect to foster or adoptions, put in your liquidated damages, which will allow you to go to small claims court, just keep it under your small claims court limit. And then you can always bring in a replevin action to actually get the quote unquote property, the bird um, back again. You know, again, a lot of this depends on state law. Um, these are state by state laws. If you have, um, you might want to go to your uh, local bar association um, and see if they can, uh, you know, recommend um, someone to you, some a lawyer on an animal law committee like we have in New York City that I belong to. Um, that might be able to advise you um, with respect to contract law, um, civil court uh, rules, and things like that in the state where you are. Also, it's really, really important that you have in your contract that the law of the state of your jurisdiction, where you are, like New York state law, applies. Um, you don't want, I, I don't know how many of you adopt to out of state to another state but you don't want to get dragged into another state or even have a question about what law will apply to this contract, um, this adoption contract, this foster agreement. Um, you want to make sure the law of your, where you are, your state um, applies. 
Um, okay, when writing up an adoption contract, should the form include any disclaimer clauses regarding temperament, behavior, etc.? Oh yes, definitely. Um, this is the place where you want to make sure you have a meeting of the minds. So you should have very specific terms considering behavior, um, temperament if you want to call it, medical, um, anything that would, um, you know, you would want to make sure that the person knows. Um, there's a, an attorney friend of mine who just drafted a um, adoption agreement that has acknowledgments and releases um, for everything under the sun. I have never seen a document quite like this, and I'm sort of surprised that people have signed it, but apparently they have. Um, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but if, if uh, people on this would like to have a, you know, this, uh, and now this is specifically to dogs, but it would give you a very good case, uh, example of what kind of um, disclaimers you should have. One sentence is, I'll just read to you, is adopter agrees that no representation about the health, nature, temperament, behavior of the dog has induced the adopter to sign this agreement, including but not limited to whether the dog has ever acted aggressively. So you're basically trying to make sure that the adopter has acknowledged that you have really been very transparent with them about this dog they hurt or cat or bird or horse and that they heard what you had to say and they agree so you're basically getting the adopter to acknowledge and agree that you as the adopter as a rescue group didn't make any claims about the temperament, the health, the age, the breed, the habits, the mental state um, of the animal that you're adopting out. Now, I know you're all adopting out absolutely fabulous animals, but in your contract, you want to make sure, and if you need to get specific about a specific animal, you may want to do that um, about some habit they have or something like that. It's just, remember, going back, a contract is a meeting of the minds, you know, offer, acceptance, consideration, meeting of the minds. You both understand the, the contract, the deal, quote unquote, that you want to, um, you know, you want that that you are making. Okay. Well, Jane, I just, before you continue, I just wanted to say that, you know, we're happy to, if if you have examples that you feel would be valuable, uh, we're absolutely happy to put those um, on our website for people to go to and refer to um, at a later date. Um, so go ahead and send me those and everyone can expect that they would be on our website. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, the next question is, if a person gets ill from an animal you adopt to them, can your organization be held liable? Um, I would actually add to this a person or another animal. Um, a non-human animal um, gets ill. Um, I think this is again, and I'm I'm sorry I keep repeating myself, but this is why you want a written contract and why you want to have language in it that limits your liability. Um, and again, that is because you have been very clear. You've made disclaimers um, that this animal X Y Z or or this animal may have been exposed or something like that. I can tell you with, with respect to dogs particularly, um, when uh, dogs are um, going to a home, we often advise our groups to tell their adopters or their fosters that for 10 to 14 days from the time the dog arrives, he or she should not be together with your animals. Even if you're, and your animals should most certainly be vaccinated. And I'm talking obviously specifically about dogs, um, have their DATPP and you know all the other vaccines they should have to protect your, your personal animals or other animals that you have. Um, because the 10 to 14 days is the incubation period 
um, for most upper respiratory um, infections. That by that time, they'll manifest themselves in most cases. So you want to quarantine. We actually say you want to, you know, isolate this animal from your other animals until you're sure um, they haven't, you know, come down with anything that you're going to want to treat them with antibiotics for. Um, so that you're not making um, any other animal ill because of some, you know, infection or or uh, disease that this this animal has come to you uh, with. So, I mean, again, with respect to birds or horses or any other animal, I'm sure that you, you know, you guys are going to know better than I what diseases or what might be passed. Um, for instance, with dogs, um, you know, there's certain skin diseases that people can get, ringworm, things like that. Um, you want to make sure that you are in your disclaimers very clearly saying you're not making any representation that this animal is whatever, clear for diseases, etc. cetera. Um, so I would, uh, also think that you're providing your adopters or you would perhaps be good for you to provide educational material um, about when you first adopt it. You know, whatever kind of animal it is, these are things you should look for, these are things you should do, um, you know, but you've also protected yourself, your organization, from um, any claims later because very clearly in this written agreement, you told these people that you were not making any representations that this animal was whatever. Um, you know, the the only, you know, one over, one thing you have to keep in mind is this is uh, the United States of America and anybody can sue anybody for any reason or no reason to a certain extent. So what you're trying to do is, is avoid um, really um, falling into, uh, you know, a situation where somebody can come back and say, I didn't know that or you didn't tell me that. So between educational material and um, a good contract with good tight disclaimers, um, I think that, you know, you're going to put yourself in the best position possible. Um, what are the most common mistakes that animal rescue groups make when drafting animal adoption contracts and how they can be avoided? Um, the most common mistake to make is to recreate the wheel, is to just decide, I'm going to draft a contract. Um, there are a lot of really, really good contract samples out there. Um, I know Mars has some really good good documents uh, about surrenders and releases and app adoption applications and adoption agreements. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, lawyers always copy contracts. If you get a good sample of a contract, you copy it because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, I would strongly suggest that if you can, con do consult a lawyer. Um, and again, you could go to your local bar association, see if there's an animal law committee, um, and a lawyer will do that pro bono. Um, it might also be worth it to actually pay a lawyer um, to have a consultation about your agreements. Um, but I would first go to the bar association and see if you can, um, you know, get a, a lawyer. Um, you know, it, it, the, and this is, it's a common, you want to have a good, strong contract that protects your group and frankly protects the animal because that's what we all want to do. That's the most important thing here as far as I'm concerned. But you don't want to have a contract that's so onerous that, um, you know, you're never going to get any animals adopted. But you want to make sure first and foremost you're protecting the animals that, you know, you're, that have been in your care and that you're adopting out to people. Um, okay, now we get into a, this question is very, very interesting and I don't think I have a very, very definitive answer. Um, we placed a bonded pair of macaws about five years ago. We just found out that the person passed away nine months ago and her sister took the birds and sold them. 
Our contract stated that our organization was to be notified and the birds returned in the event the adopter was unwilling or unable to care for them. We were able to track who the birds were sold to, what are legal remedies. Um, the first thing that I would suggest, and this goes back to the um, session that I think Francis Carlisle just did last week, which was, you know, especially with respect to animals that are very long lived, I mean, it's actually almost any long, but especially birds, I would think, um, and horses, um, you really might want to um, have a strong suggestion, if not an absolute um, requirement, something to think about. Um, I talked this over with a couple of lawyer friends of mine, is to have the adopter um, draw up a will and make sure you get a copy. Um, because once again, animals are property. This woman died, the animal was her property, animals, the macaws, um, and a question sort of for us was, okay, her sister took the birds and sold them. Was the sister even aware of this, um, that there was in fact a contract and that the birds were to be returned? Um, you know, then you get into a question of um, if the sister inherited all of the property of the sister who passed away, the birds are property, they pass to her, you know, is she then the owner? Um, and, you know, so you, 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 the best way to um, perhaps protect the bird um, is to have people make a will and a trust for the birds, um, or at least a will where they are Specifically, you know, these birds or any birds I own at the time of my death are to be, you know, are I give and bequeath to, you know, XYZ bird rescue. Um, so, you know, the person obviously was willing and able to care for them, I assume, up until the time of their her death, but then because of their property status, the sister sold, took and sold them. Did she inherit them? Did she even have good title to pass? Um, I think that this is this is actually kind of murky, and depending on the um, state laws, I think this is this is something where a lawyer really does have to be um, you know, have to be consulted. Um, but to protect yourself in the future. I would think you would want to put something in, um, you know, there's a variety of ways. You have to do a will. The will, they need to be left in the will to us. Um, and if you don't agree to that, then we're not going to do the adoption. Or you need to be informed of the people who, um, like this sister, maybe a family member, maybe a friend, maybe if in the event of your death, you know, um, who needs to be consulted about this? Um, do they have a lawyer, an immediate close friend? Um, you know, you put in something that in the event of your death, the ownership will revert to the rescue. So this sister would not then have had title to the birds to, she wouldn't, they were not property she inherited and she could not have sold them. And then you would have some legal remedies going back to small claims court because she violated the agreement. But, you know, then there's the question about does the agreement, you know, was she even a party to this agreement? There was no meeting of the minds with her because she might not even have been aware of um, the contract. If she did, that's a, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And with respect to who the birds were sold to, um, I guess, you know, some of it is you, if you have a really good written contract that has all those terms in, um, it gives you some ability to have a conversation with this person. Um, but I certainly think if you have a written agreement and they, you were able to have a conversation with this person who said, look, I know you in good faith bought this bird, but in fact, this person did not have title to the bird. Um, and, you know, they're supposed to be returned to our um, care, you know, 
perhaps you would be willing to adopt this person and you, you know, you explain to them, you're just trying to make sure that the birds are in good hands, um, you know, that you had made a lifetime commitment to them, et cetera. Um, and a little off topic, but um, there's two really good books about negotiating and it's Getting to Yes by Fry and Yuri, U-R-Y. And then another book that Yuri wrote uh, years later, they were from the Harvard Negotiation Project or something like that. The next book was called Getting Past No. So, um, you know, this is a this is a really hard question, um, and I think the best you can do is put stuff in your contract ahead of time um, that requires somebody to make sure that ownership will revert back to you guys. Um, one of our adoptive homes has been breeding lovebirds we placed with them. Our adoption contract clearly stated no breeding and even included a clause that outlined population control methods that the adopter agreed to at the time. We want to pursue legal action to retrieve the bird. Can we also sue for possession of the offspring? Um, yes, I mean, you can, if, if you have a written contract, which you do, which states if it states very clearly no breeding and that the, in the event that any clause in this contract is violated, that ownership will revert back to the group. Um, and then you also put in a liquidated damages. And then you also um, reserve your right to bring an action for Replevin to actually get the bird back once you've got the money from the small claims court suit. Um, with respect to the, the um, offspring, again, you need to put, you should put in your contract that, you know, you are, if just flat out saying that it is a violation of the agreement to breed these animals, if for these birds, if for any reason, whether it was done deliberately or because they were careless or whatever, any offspring of the birds that were adopted to you, ownership of those birds revert, that offspring reverts to the rest of the So again, I don't know how this happened, whether they're deliberately breeding them and selling them, um, again, that's something you might want to put in your contract. You're not allowed to breed, and if you do, if you sell them, that's a violation. And, you know, again, you go through liquidated damages, you go through replevin. Um, we are a dog and cat shelter, and our policy is to spay or neuter, yay, all animals before they are adopted out. Since birds cannot be spayed or neutered, we could use some advice on including a clause that prohibits breeding, but how enforceable would it be in the event the adopter violates the terms. It would be very enforceable. Um, again, enforcing a contract means you are gonna have to do some work. Um, but if you have a contract, those terms are clearly set out and they violate those terms, then that's the reason you have a contract. Um, and that's the reason, again, you have liquidated damages and um, that's why you need to make it very clear to the adopter without coming on as a heavy, but that, you know, how serious you take this contract. Um, this isn't, as earlier somebody said, a list of, you know, suggestions. It's like, you know, we're very serious about this and we will, you know, come back to enforce, um, you know, our rights under this contract. And it's not because we think you're a bad person or you're gonna do a bad thing. Our first and last and most important thing is to provide protection for the animals. That's why we have this contract. That's why we have these terms in here. And, um, you know, if anything happens, we will be enforcing these contracts. Um, question, how does one delicately have a conversation um, with an elderly adopter uh, that has an interest in adopting a young bird and raising the age issue, could you expose your organization to any liability? Um, anytime you raise any of the, what we consider protected classes um, into, which is age, 
you know, gender, um, race, some states disability, some states uh, sexual preference, etc. You're just opening up a can of worms, potential can of worms for yourself. So um, don't ever bring up age. I, I mean, I think um, what you need to do is, is judge that person based on the way you would judge any other adopter. Um, I understand with birds, if it's a very long-lived bird, um, or maybe not that long-lived, that you're thinking, oh, well, what's going to happen if this person doesn't outlive the bird? Um, you know, to me, I wouldn't necessarily rule out an, an elder, and I'm not sure what elderly is. I may be elderly at this point. A doctor is. Um, to me, it's maybe you take precautions. If this person is otherwise, it would be a great home for the bird. Maybe you go the route of you, you ensure this person has a will and a trust for this bird in the event that they predecease. So actually anybody can, you know, predecease any pet. Um, what's your plans um, for the future? Is your family willing is your, to take this bird? Are they willing to go through the adoption process again? Um, but I would not specifically get into um, any kind of age discussion. Um, I, I just wouldn't. I, I would really rather see somebody go the route of, um, you know, uh, making, again, trying to take care, what you're trying to do is take care of the animal, maybe have this person, make sure this person has a will and a plan for what will happen um, if and when, depending on how old they are and how young the bird is that they outlive this bird. Um, and then the final question is, what defines a bird as exotic? Um, I found out getting ready for this just sort of quickly that there are actually 9,000 species of birds, which is kind of astonishing. Um, I would defer to um, Denise on this. Um, I, you know, it depends on the law is, as I said, state by state. Um, I don't know why we would be defining what exotic is. I mean, my understanding of exotic is, is you know, um, we use exotics for a lot of different type of pets, actually. Um, you know, there's might be different definitions in the environmental conservation law and ag and markets in the penal code. So I, for that one, I think I'm going to say um, I'm going to have to defer to Denise. And I hope um, some of these, my answers have been useful. If you have follow-up questions, I'm certainly happy to try to answer them. Denise? Um, it's tech. I my understanding is it's a, a non-native species. So any bird that is non-native to the United States. So would that But be again, that that could also that you know, there could be some other differentiations, but uh an overall would be birds that are non-native. So they come from another country, uh their origin is outside the US. In the United States, they would consider that an exotic bird. Actually, I, if I can, the you know there was a, hmm. I think an idea about um, one of the questions was about a foster who won't return a bird, and I guess in mm -hmm. your consideration of taking on fosters, do you have different something to think about? Do you have different criteria for a foster as opposed to an adopter? I mean, we have a lot of what we call foster failures. Um, which means they go on to want to keep the cat or the dog or the rabbit um, that they, um, you know, that they're supposedly fostering. Um, just be clear, do you want to give your foster the right of first refusal if you're going to adopt the dog, a, a cat, bird, whatever, to someone else? Um, you know, do you want to inform the person do you want to, you know you don't necessarily have a duty to inform the person but just to define more the relationship and what your duty is to them um do you want to give them a priority to adopt do you want to give them a right of first refusal do you want to give them you know notification um but it's you know just again the more you have the meeting of the minds the discussion up front um i think the better um you know you're going to be off you're going to be 
And with that, I think mm -hmm. I have run through all the questions. Um, so I turn it back to the, the moderators. So actually, I wanted to kind of follow up on that discussion a little bit. So going back to that course question about, um, you know, handing over having a probationary period versus long term care. Um, and you kind of I introduced the idea of using the foster agreement as a probation. So could there be an indefinite foster relationship or is that maybe too well, aggressive? That, no, I mean, we, you know, there's a, at least with respect to dogs and cats, um, we have had situations where we have an outright adoption. We have a situation where we have foster, which is a foster, you know, and as I said, you could either specify the period of time. Um, if you're going to go beyond that, you should tr probably have another written agreement extending that uh, foster agreement. But we also have um, long-term fosters where for some reason um, this person is not really ready to adopt, um, but that, you know, they're perfectly happy continuing to foster. Um, and that may be because the animal has a medical issue um, and they want to know they have the, the assistance or the backup or, you know, um, resources from the group to help them with that. Um, I think that the, um, you know, the, the point is it's fabulous to have a probation period or a foster with intent um, as a way to, to make it very clear that you retain ownership of the animal until such time as the adoption is finalized. Um, but, you know, we've had people who have fostered, which we then start calling long-term fosters, because, you know, again, they're not ready to adopt for whatever reason, but they, you know, are perfectly happy to keep the animal um, and foster them for as long as we need them to. I'm not, does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and would you use the same kind of language if, if you were requiring a will for a long-lived species, so you wanted to see a will being written up to provide long-term protection for that animal, would do you think that a foster, like a temporary fostership, could be used in until that will was in place, or or what kind of language you use in that kind well, of interim? Well, well, with a foster, um, and you have a very good foster agreement. Title has never passed to that person. So you wouldn't have mm -hmm. a will in that situation because that person doesn't own the bird. Well, I'm saying for someone who wanted to adopt, but you wanted to require a will, but didn't want to give ownership until that will was in place. So would there be kind of a, a conditional contract? Or, well, or how would that be set up? Well, I mean, I guess with respect to the, this would be, what I was talking about specifically was an adoption where you had adopted to this woman um, and she had died and then the sister got the birds or whoever. If, right. if that person adopted them, the bird was her property. Un, we need to dispose of, of our property. I mean, that disposed legal term, dispose of our property. Um, and, you know, you need to, by having a will that says this specific piece of property but, you know, I give and bequeath to bird rescue. Um, you, the woman, the sister, you know, never got, you know, if she inherited the property, she never got title to the animals. If she was, you know, under the, the, the sister, if the sister, let's say she had a will and she didn't mm -hmm. mention the bird specifically, the sister as the executor is under the, is under an obligation to maximize the assets of the, re, of the estate of which the birds are part, so she sold that piece of property to increase the resources. So in that situation, the person who owns the bird, who absolutely owns the bird, it's their property, it, I would think it might not be a bad idea to ask them to have a will, especially for, and they should understand, for a long life species, you wanna make it very clear to your executor, to your family member, to your beneficiary, this is not, this property has already been given and bequeathed to animal rescue. This bird, this horse 
is to go back to the rescue, you know, uh, I give and bequeath. Um, mm -hmm. With respect to a foster, they don't really have ownership, so having a will really wouldn't do any good at that point. I would think at the point where you've done the foster, you've had six months, you feel, everybody feels that you want to move forward. At that point, when you do an adoption agreement, up until that time, you haven't done an adoption agreement, you've done a foster mm -hmm. agreement. At the time you do the adoption agreement for the long life species, you may very well want to advise them to do, you know, a will, ask them, mm -hmm. advise them to do a will. And if they're, you know, if they really love these birds and they are adopting them, they're going to want the best, hopefully, for them. And realizing mm -hmm. the birds going back to to you or the horse who has special expertise, um, you know, I, I'm thinking horses and um, birds are possibly not as user friendly as a dog or a cat. I know rabbits yeah. aren't as user friendly, so it's really, you know, more. You don't have to, you can't ask somebody to make a will to, for property they don't own at that point in time. I don't know if that this, answered your question. No, I, yeah, I think, I think it does. Great. Thanks. Well, um, I, I really enjoy this and I really thank you, Jane, for, for participating. And, um, we're like Robin mentioned, we'll, um, this has been recorded and so we'll put this up on our, oh, no, I don't see it. Um, on the GFAS website, on our avian education page. Um, just want to make sure again. That Kelly, you, it's the next. Oh, it is the next slide. Okay, thanks. Sorry. So here yeah, it is. Um, so we will um, post this on our, our website in the next couple of days. And um, I, I definitely encourage all of you to to really pass this around and, and um, also, again, go, oops, uh, refer back. Who keeps popping through? slides um also you know just reminder a lot of great applica uh, um adoption information on the avian welfare coalition site and as jane mentioned mars also has um, an avian adoption um some contracts that can be looked at and used as examples as well and um again just thank you so much and this is the the last of the adoption series um, we will be continuing to promote this adoption series because, you know, we really want to give you the shelters and or whoever who's listening, the rescues, um, some tools to not only provide short term care, but ultimately protect the lives of these animals um, for its entirety. And uh, thank you, Denise, for your really um, amazing work in putting this together and Robin for um, participating and putting together the presentation and keeping us organized. So, um, Robin, did you have any last minute housekeeping? Or Denise, did you want to say a last word? Um, I just wanted to thank Jane again. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention that Jane has been enormously helpful and supportive of avian welfare uh, since I started AWC and has opened up many doors um, for us. Uh, in the animal protection community, so I want to thank her for that. And Robin and Kelly, you are the best teammates. Um, this has just been a wonderful experience, and I'm looking forward to doing more. And I hope yep. everyone uh, will utilize these um, resources going forward because you can keep going back to them and referencing them, especially these last two on the estate planning and um, on adoption contracts because there is a lot of technical stuff in there and, you know, to really understand how you can best, you know, secure those two things for birds going forward, especially those long-lived ones when, you know, they're going to outlive a lot of people, including us. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again. Thanks. And Robin, did you have any last-minute housekeeping? I don't think so. I think you covered it all. Just again, thank you to everybody for attending and to Jane and Kelly and Denise. Great. Okay. Thank you. Have, everybody have a great day. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.